Greetings, everyone. Uh, it is my humble pleasure to welcome you to this webinar titled The Landscape Culture Today and Tomorrow, Looking for New Ways of Understanding and Raising Awareness of the Landscape. This is an event part of the IFLA 75th anniversary program, which explores the importance of landscape and its different understandings across regions and countries. Through a high caliber list of worldwide speakers, this webinar brings various forms of activism, entrepreneurship, innovation, and culture into the everyday work of landscape architects. Since its foundation in 1948 in Cambridge by Sir Jeffrey Gajelico, IPLA has grown to be the body that represents 78 national members and more than 50,000 landscape architects worldwide. As the only international non-government organization representing landscape architects in the world, IFLA's mission is to promote the profession within a collaborative partnership with international agencies and allied built environment disciplines, demanding the highest standards of education, training, research, and professional practice. While we have come a long way, we still have a long journey ahead of us to give the proper recognition that landscape architecture deserves. It is through our joint efforts and events such as this one that we keep expanding our knowledge and experience. Leadership and stewardship were never so important as now for landscape architects. We have the knowledge and the tools to lead the change and protect our ecosystems for future generations. IFLA will ensure we will keep advancing the profession. We are the profession of the 21st century, and we are well equipped to deal with the pressures that will define new ways of living and designing for future generations. This event also allows us to bridge the gap between academia and IFLA. We need academics and practitioners to coexist as a global professional organization. In this regard, I invite all universities, even firms and practices to join IFLA as corporate members. Universities can also apply for IFLA recognition of academic programs. IFLA is a knowledge hub where members can share expertise and propose new ways of doing things. Because together we can advocate and protect the values we believe are important for landscape architects. The success of IFLA depends on the success of all of our members. As this year of celebration, please keep participating in events related to the 75th anniversary of IFLA. Keep an eye on the website for more details and join us at our first ever bilateral IFLA World Council and Congress in late September. You can choose two different destinations either Stockholm in Sweden or Nairobi in Kenya. Both will be packed with activities. Many thanks for your attention, and I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the speakers for their time and everyone who worked relentlessly to organize this event. I hope we can gather again soon to celebrate many more accomplishments as a profession. I wish all of you a successful event and a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi to everyone. Many thanks to Bruno Marquez, our IFLA president, for the introductory speech. I'm uh, Alessandro Martinelli. I'm the chair of this webinar and also the chair of the Education Academic Affairs Committee at IFLA. I want to remind that this webinar was supported by IFLA APR that provided technical economical support for the realization. I also introduce myself quickly. Beside being active in IFLA, I'm associate professor at the Chinese Culture University Landscape Department in Taipei. I'm a partner in a landscape architecture firm based in Taipei, BIAS Architect Associate, and I'm editorial director at List Lab in Barcelona, a publishing agency devoted to landscape, urban design, and architecture. In this, in this uh, slide, 
I hope everyone can see it. There are my emails, chair.eaa at iflaworld.org for the IFLA related things and asma.mitark at gmail.com for all the other things. If you need me, I suggest you to take a screenshot so you have the chance to contact me in the future. This webinar, which was organized in the context of the 75th anniversary celebration, it is titled The Landscape Culture Today and Tomorrow. It is a fairly simple topic and at the same time very context. We ask some people, important people, and some young progressive um, academic or theorists to think about looking for new ways of understanding and raising awareness of the landscape. How can we raise awareness? How the things are done? What can we do in the future? And uh, this webinar was organized with a global scope. We have uh, speakers from three IFLA regions, from America, from Europe, and from Asia. And we have registered public about 500 people from 66 nations worldwide, which means one third of the nation worldwide currently participating in this webinar. The speakers are connected, as you see below, from Philadelphia, from Boston, from Basel, from Karlsruhe, from Dresden, from Beijing, from Taipei, from Canberra and Wellington. In this moment, we cover the whole world. The webinar is divided into three different sections after the opening one. The first section comprises three short presentations by three keynote speakers very renowned figures of landscape architecture profession, active both in the practice and in the academia. They are Gunther Vogt, Yukon Jen, Lori Olin. To all of them, we ask to shortly present what they are doing with their own practice and in the academia to promote landscape culture. After these three keynote speakers, we will have a challenge section which is a round table animated by three young and pro progressive debaters. They are Julian Raxworthy, which was the previous EAA chair and the current EAA advisor, but also associate professor at University of Canberra in Australia. We have Anna Jurich, which is curator at ZKM Center for Media and Art in Karlsruhe, um, which is a Institute, which is not directly related to landscape, but is operating in ways which are very relevant for landscape. And then we have Rosalia Munasella from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. These three debaters, we will, they will give a short presentation of themselves, and each of them will offer a question, challenge to one of the three keynote speakers. After that, we will, leave, we will have a short debate. And finally, we will have some closing remarks by Steffi Schuppel, which is the chair of the IFLA 75th anniversary working group. I hope everyone can enjoy the webinar of today. And I hope that it can contribute to increase the reach of IFLA in the world today. That said, I leave the floor to Mr. Kunter Vogt, which is supposed to give us the first presentation. Please, Gunther Vogt, I'll let you the floor. <laughs> yes, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Quite well. OK. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> as far as I saw on, on, the, on, the, uh, on my desk. Um, I'm talking about landscape architecture, but normally I never de de uh, talk about city and landscape. Normally, especially in the office and with my students, it's always about landscape. So for us, landscape, especially in Europe, it's more or less urbanized. But in this case, since I only have 15 minutes, I divide it into <clears throat> two questions. One is the landscape and one is the city. And then finally, what does it mean for our teaching our, and our um, uh, practice? First of all, <clears throat> just to look a little bit back at what you see here is it, it is Europe. You can't see it, but you will see it soon. So in the past, we protected landscapes. And so 
it, it was a kind of strategy to keep a, a certain quality of landscape. And now you can see on the left hand side, Spain and Italy in the middle, and you can see Germany is more or less a protected national park area. And this was the past. And I think this is a tradition we had in Europe. And especially for our students, it's sometimes difficult to understand why do we have to protect landscape as, uh, so much, since it, these are beautiful landscape, but we have to protect them. And then the next question for us, and this is now into the future, <laughs> when we look at it, let's look into the future. Here you see the, the Alps in the middle, uh, seven countries from France to uh, Italy, Germany, Switzerland to Slovenia. And in the middle, you see all these protected landscapes, and it's still an ongoing process. And for us, and when we are working with the students, it's a real problem that we protect the landscapes. That means we are not allowed to do everything we would like to do in a landscape, but to give a different understanding. And as you know, in such a conference like now, you heard in the last 10 years that in 2050, 50% 50 of the world population will live in cities. So my question is then what happens with the landscape? And that's what we are doing with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, our students. And you again, you see the time running on the left down. And can we not think about landscape in the future, especially big landscapes like this um, alpine region? Can we not think in a different way? Instead of protecting it, we develop it. And you see it here, <clears throat> that's the future. Let's say in 80 years from now, that it's no longer a more or less protected landscape, but it's a progressive landscape. And you see all the urbanized ring about this, around this landscape, a kind of hinterland, if you want. And uh, <clears throat> what can we do with this landscape? And that's, uh, especially in Europe, I think in the US or North America or in the Americas, North and South and in the Asian countries, landscape architects were more used this is large scale and this is come, should come back and that's a real problem in, especially in Central Europe, that the scale is very small and landscape architects don't feel responsible for this large scale, but we should really be involved in this uh, discussion uh, uh, about uh, these large scale landscapes. Because, <clears throat> you know, um, <clears throat> so you see what, what we are doing with our students, for instance, especially in central Switzerland, we will have a completely new landscape within 40, 50 years. And you see it uh, in the film um, that all these glaciers in light blue will disappear and we will have many, many lakes all over Switzerland, there will be in 60, 70 years around 2000 lakes, new lakes. And this is now the question, <laughs> are we responsible as landscape architects? What happens with this new uh, lake landscape? And there we should have an answer. And in, in the past, we didn't react on this, but now it's really coming in a very intensive way. And I think the society is expecting from us more and more, we are asked, but could it be used for hydropower, for tourism, whatever? And that's a real question to landscape architects. It is the discipline, as you mentioned, of this uh, century, I believe. But still, I think we are not feeling responsible. This is a map of Switzerland and partly France, Germany, Italy. It was a study by ETH Studio Basel, by Herzog and Tumeron, Marcel Maili and Roche Diener, um, doing a portrait of Switzerland. And you see the main part of Switzerland, around 40%, light blue are the touristic hotspots, the resorts, and the brownish are, these, uh, are the Alps. And they described it as an abandoned landscape. And then everybody was criticizing it, that architects or urban planners are not really understanding what it means, but it's not wilderness. Uh, it's really an abandoned landscape. In the last 
12, 13 years, <coughs> this was the discussion in Switzerland. And nobody, especially not landscape architects, felt responsible to give an answer. And that's what we are doing in teaching now. Of course, this is much too big to deal with it, just to declare 40% of Switzerland as an abandoned landscape. And <clears throat> But now it was extremely stable the last 10 years, but now we have, we have this discussion about energy production. So <clears throat> immediately, where are the big photovoltaics, the hydropower, the wind uh, turbines installed? in the abandoned landscape, because we didn't have an idea how to, to develop such a landscape. And that's what we are doing with our students and going closer. This is only part of this landscape I showed you before. And so we, we are working with our students and profiling the landscape, not saying this is for 150, 250 kilometers, just an abandoned landscape, but we really profile the landscape. And then instead of using, you know, you have uh, landscape, paysage, paisaggio, and all these expressions, but we ask the students, we are interested in valleyscapes. What you see here, it's really related to different valleys. And what, how, where do you see the future of these valleys? Is it still or completely abandoned wilderness? Uh, is it for hydropower production? Is it for tourism? What is it for? And then it, it comes more in a very good way, say, clarifies the situation valley for valley and not uh, uh, on the large scale. Still, it's a large scale for students, but they're really able to, to define or a profile for these different valleys. And uh, that's for us uh, very interesting. So now <clears throat> I mentioned I'm not so interested in landscape and cities, but uh, for the students, it's very important that we do this, uh, we talk in a different way about landscape and cities. And talking about cities in Europe, <clears throat> we have the problem in the big metropolitan areas. Again, there is a dis uh, intensification. It's a, the urbanization is the last 20, 30 year was very strong. So <clears throat> all the metropolitan areas are getting denser and denser. And what we, don't have is enough uh, public space or parks or green spaces. And just uh, an example, we worked with the students in Paris. And here you see uh, Paris in the old days, quite nice. But the end of the 19th century, there was a, <clears throat> a change in the uh, urban culture. So two big parks were added, but I have to say not really parks, uh, forests were transformed into parks because there were new sports activities uh, like tennis or football, baseball, swimming, all these kind of new sports needed more space and Paris couldn't provide it in the inner part of the city. That's one problem, especially London and Paris have this problem. They don't really have enough public space and it's more and more in big metropolitan situations that we don't have enough space uh, just to, to provide uh, really a space for people living in such a situation. And what can be, uh, how can we solve this problem as landscape architects? And the other problem is uh, the heat island and uh, especially Paris is, uh, as you know, we have this real problem in the last two weeks in Europe mainly in Athens, in Greece and Italy, uh, between 45 and close to 50 degrees heat. And the, in Paris, it's it's uh, case in Europe is the worst. And, uh, so in 2018, in this hot summer, close to 5,000 elderly people died because it was too hot in the summer. And there is the question, but how can we deal as architects and or landscape architects, and how can we combine this question for new public space with this heat island problem? And if <coughs> I explained it, and this is now from our office, I explained it to the students. In rea reality, it will a, a really drastic change of the 
structure of Paris. Because if you want to bring cold air from, from outside uh, city center into the city center, you have to destroy many buildings. And then all my students are very upset. You, you cannot destroy Paris. And then I can just say, <laughs> Hausmann destroyed 23,000 buildings to control the city for the military and the police. And says, this is the scale we have to work in future. And, and by the way, all these channels leading from outside to inside have to come from meadows because the cold air production is in, on, in meadows. And trees are not so good because they are blocking the cold air coming into the cities. And this will be a question in the, in the future. And our students are really in this climate change debate. By the way, I never use <laughs> climate change as, a, as a, a word. I always use climate catastrophe. And so, but for the students, it's interesting. How can we still work in such a situation? And that's what we are doing with, uh, with the students. And finally, coming to the students' work, <clears throat> perhaps I give you a bit uh, uh, some thoughts or what we did in the last years, what we changed in our teaching. First of all, what I learned, we are integrating more and more other disciplines, natural scientists, such as biologists, botanists, geologists, whatever. What I learned from them is that we have to teach 30%, 3-0% of our teaching time outside. And that's really interesting for me because our students don't have so many uh, experience in landscape. I mean, physical body experience in the landscape. And if you work with landscape, it's <clears throat> for us more and more important that we go out with the students. And of course, we build physical models. We do a lot of things to explain students. For instance, in the middle, you see a so-called tasting where we taste honey of a landscape or cheese or whatever, what is the production or what is the production behind such a landscape? And we definitely go out. This is an example we did in the region of Basel with, with a, a group of students. You see my, my uh, co-teacher, Thomas Kissling with his t-shirt, the so-called zero meter established by Lucius Burkhardt and the French artist um, Paul Armanchette, where does the landscape really begin? And I mean, here it's clear, it begins in front of his body. And so where we have this discussion with the students and have kind of short performances uh, in the landscape, where we discuss all the questions we are afterwards work on in the academic uh, uh, background. And that's uh, very important for us to have this real experience in the real landscape and to, dis to discuss uh, what we are doing in the real landscape. And I think this will really be the future that we will be more outside and less academia. But <clears throat> the final, <clears throat> to come to an end, what from the beginning of my teaching, I found the theory background is not present or not strong enough. Uh, it depends in which country you live and you teach. So it's a lack of theory in landscape is really a problem. And so, but you cannot only complain, you have to do something against it. And this is an exchange platform we installed instead close to our office or next to our office. It's an exchange platform between the normal uh, office we are, where we are doing landscape architectural pro projects and um, a platform between the office and the university. And here we have, installed the library of Lucius Burkhardt. I already mentioned him, a very famous sociologist, very influential in between the 1960s and 2000 in Switzerland and Germany. And we published one of his book, Ontology of the Landscapes. That means where he describes in 10 theses, it's about the island, the wilderness, not the traditional typology we know, and then what are the related texts out of uh, literature. And there we found out that we can deal with the students more about theory if we bring it like this. And that's just a little bit what we are doing in teaching.
Thank you for your interest. Thank you. We now leave the floor to Ms. Mr. Kunju. Hi. We let you the floor to present. Yes. Uh, so I share my screen. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning or good evening, no matter. We don't what. see yet your screen. Okay. Here's Wait my second, screen. Please. Can you see it? Wait. Wait, please. Yeah. Now we can see. Yeah. If you can make it full screen, that would be great. Yeah, it's full screen. Perfect. Is it right? Yes, now it's perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. President of group, uh, Bruno, Marcus, uh, Loria, Gasa. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you on screen. First of all, congratulations, uh, 75th anniversary, uh, IFLA. Wonderful platform for us to share some knowledge. So it's a great honor for me to share some of my thinking about landscape culture. Particularly the Chinese landscape cultures, I wish it a plus cultures, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, compared to what Gaza is talking about, we have totally, I think, a very different idea about landscape. So subject is about today's or tomorrow's landscape culture. But uh, as we believe that we cannot understand today's landscape without understanding yesterday's landscape cultures. There are two kinds of landscape cultures in, the, in yesterday's Chinese uh, uh, civilization. The so art of survival on the land and the art of mountain and water fantasy. There are two kinds of landscape cultures. For most of the Chinese history, for over 5,000 years, landscape culture, landscape culture has largely been shaped by agriculture which divided the people into two classes, the peasant majority, and, and that, is made, that made his living by working with the land, and the minority upper class that controlled and enjoyed its territory and its productivity. Thus two di very distinct different landscape cultures were created. The landscape culture as art of surviving from the land, which the similar idea about landscape, a landschaft, which is the land and its people. So the, the, the another landscape culture is the landscape culture as a persuasion of fantasy and leisure, which means landscape is equal to mountain and water. Remember, mountain and water, like alpine, there's no cultivation, there's no, there's no land, no, 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 no terraces. Adapting for the farmers, for the peasants, adapting and transforming the natural landscape and make, making a living is a challenge of the vast national landscape you can see here, less than 10% is arable. But in several basins, with monsoon climate, there are fertile land and thus support an extremely dense population. People have to make wise use of limited land, live with nature, follow the changing cycle of nature and reuse and recycle everything for survival. Prudent use, reuse, recycle of land, water and nutrients for thousands of years. And thanks to these values of sustainability and through the efforts of hundreds of generations, the working landscape reached a subtle, very subtle, stable state where the needs of man and nature are balanced for some time, but not always, okay, for some time only. This was imagined to be a land of peach blossoms and ecologically healthy, socially stable, and bountiful paradise. The upper class at the same time, the upper class elite valued pressures far beyond their 
immediate surroundings and daily existence. And beyond the simple concern about productivity and utility of the landscape, which lead to the creation of fine art. For them, landscape is mountain and water, and the working land and the people on it are merely a mere embarrassment. For them, there's so much to explore. China's vast and diverse expanses of mountain and water inspired generations of the elite minority and artists led to a rich accumulation of landscape art of fantasy, ranging from le legends like the Odyssey of Mountain and Water, which was believed to be 2000 years old, to the fable of the land of peach borrow sons. And even imagined and dreamed like these pictures painted more than a thousand years ago. It's rockery mountain, no cultivation, no agriculture, no people, a tree walking, just an embar embarrassment, all right? And the many have been discovered only very recently. They are depicted and represented. Here, just fairly newly discovered landscape and they have developed this art and are recreated as gardens and rockeries. Now that's becomes a man-made Chinese garden. Such fantasy landscapes were also created at the scale of entire cities at a cost limited only by the power and the wealth of emperor. Of the emperor. This is Qin Dynasty Yuan Ming Yuan and its vicinity was built at the same time as Louis XIV, uh, who built the Palace of Versailles. So both landscape cultures together helped to build the traditional Chinese cultural identity. They fulfill both the spiritual and the material needs of the people. But the latter has been well described and known to the rest of the world but as a former, namely landscape culture as an art of adaptation and how to transform the landscape to provide the necessary societies of, of life is largely absent, ignored from the history book and the very little known is little known to the rest of the world, particularly the European uh, 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 people. Today, industrialized landscape culture with the coming rise of artificial intelligence together with urbanization and globalization is transforming the traditional into modern. This is, this is a ready play one. Yeah, it's the image. Everyone knows that. Yeah, it's a, a, a hot shot. It's a hot hat in China also. This new landscape transformation has come with high cost, the loss, the loss of cultural identity, or even the loss of future generations' right to live. And it will certainly impact the sustainability of the global future. When you consider a quarter or a, 50, a, a, a fifth of the population are uh, actually Chinese. So, while the mountain and water fantasy may continue to evolve in digital form for consumption by the urban majority. Now, this is Africa, uh, inspired by the Chinese mountain uh, here. Our fertile land nearby and Sansui or, or mountain and water afar are both deformed by the power of modern or industrial technology. Usually, uh, that's usually under the name of good sense, or good reasons, including something we call the green energy, uh, producing of green energy, that actually also deforming our mountain and water. So yesterday's the fantasy of mountain and water has now become 
Chinese Chinese Sanshui. This this is a representation by a, a, a very modern contemporary artist. So these are the new challenges are side effects of industrialization, including climate change, of course. But uh, in addition, we have food security issues, floods, drought, pollution, habitat loss. They all come together at the same time. So when we are messing up the land of the land and the sanctuary or mountain and water, the land and the mountain and water, okay, three, uh, two different things, the land, cultivation of land, farmers' landscape, and this mountain and water, the so elite landscape. Both of them have been messed up by the so-called industrial uh, 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 forces. What we have built or transformed is but a techno dystopia, a dystopia and a scene in ready Player one, you can see the similar, the same. And this is coming true, right? This is coming true. That's so that's why this is our call. This is our cause for our future landscape culture. Landscape as adaptation and transformation of future unsustainable industrialized landscape. To instead, Heal the planet, designing ecologies for holistic landscape services. And it must be at a large scale and able to be realized practically overnight. So this is the future landscape culture. So it is time now to rediscover the ancient landscape culture as an art of survival. You using fairly simple tools to transform the global surface at a fast scale in a sustainable way, such as terracing the slope, pounding the valley, diking the ground, and islanding the swamp in order to, to transform the landscape to sustain for sustainable use for people to live and build for at the same time. So for the past 20 years, my team at Turnscape and our students working together, we actually science and art working together to transform the landscape. These are just some of the demonstration, terracing the flood wall to make, it, to make people living with water, terracing the slope to clean polluted water by removing nutrients, slow biological process, transforms the riverbank. This is the Huangpu River in Shanghai. And the terraces to remediate the solid waste and the sewage water. This is a case in Handan City, inspired by the terraces of Chinese agriculture. Dramatically transformed, produce clean water and a better soil. And the pounding and diking to create a sponge city to manage urban flood pounding the ground to create a native habitat to heal the earth, to create an urban oasis for people to enjoy, and islanding contaminated lowlands to create a floating forest adapted to monsoon flooding, while recovering the habitat for biodiversity at the same time, create parks and, and, and solve the problem of urban flood. Similarly, in just one year and on a minimum budget, a hundred plus acre brownfield was transformed into an urban oasis, green sponge, right in the middle of Bangkok in Thailand, and now become a favorite place for people to use. So I'm talking not just a piece of park or a piece of water, I'm talking about the, the transformation of the whole gray urban infrastructure from gray into green. Huh? And I'm not just talking about a river or infrastructure. We are talking about even bigger size, hundreds of square kilometers in size, 
for example, this uh, Bohai Sea, 70, I mean, 700 square kilometers in size, heavily contaminated, and our pilot project is to create sponge, coastal land to filtrate urban runoff and clean the agricultural nutrients before they running into the ocean. Meanwhile, they cover the habitat along the coastal line. So more than ever, we have to rethink the way we build our cities, the way we treat water and nature, and even the way we define civilization. So while the fantasy may continue to reach beyond the landscape in which we live, our vision will ultimately return to the real landscape of descent nature. Now, this is a finishing line in Ready Play One. I hope this gives you some idea what is my understanding about landscape culture. Thank you. Many thanks for your presentation, Mr. Yu. Now I want to ask uh, Mr. Lori Olin to give us his presentation. All right, here we go. Share the screen. Oh dear, share. Where'd it go? Oh my God. Can't see it. Uh, you're on top of my presentation. There we go. Okay. All right, can, can you hear me? Um, yes, and also we can see your presentation. That's good, thanks. Sorry for the slow start. Um, first, I wanna applaud my colleagues and their words and their works. They're quite remarkable and beautiful and important. And I wanna thank IFLA for inviting me to present two entities that I care very deeply for. That is the Landscape Department at the University of Pennsylvania and a firm called Olin at Philadelphia. Um, the world today, the state of it is in one of great upheaval and crisis, and much of it's driven by, you know, this warming planet. Hundreds of millions of people around the world are already affected by the current state of the environment. It's a real genuine proportion. It's a catastrophe, as Gunter said, of epic proportion. And everybody in landscape architecture today is aware of the situation. The topics and the problems are familiar to us all, climate change, carbon sequestration, ecology and biodiversity extinction, community and justice, health, equity, and you know, all, there still are issues about art and craft and technology, even matters as implied of spirit and of beauty. So while much of the situation at the largest scale can only be addressed through political and economic changes of policy and action, our profession can do an enormous amount to help with the immediate short and long-term regional and local physical situations. Now the landscape department, landscape department of landscape architecture and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania has been involved in environmental concerns for the past 60 years. And despite the dynamics and the flux of personalities, that are normal to any institution, an ecological understanding and approach to design and planning is baked into the DNA of the landscape department at Penn and those who've passed through since Ian McCarg revitalized the program. And the faculty helped develop methods of ecological design and planning that utilize the integrated overlay analysis that led to the GIS methods and digital practices that are universal in the field today. Well, the Department of Landscape Architecture today at Penn can, constitutes several activities within the Weissman School of Design. First, the most fundamental to our department is the professional degree curriculum for landscape architecture and regional planning, and also our dual degree programs with architecture, with city planning, preservation. Fundamental to this is an ecological approach to the widest variety of landscape and public space, to public works and infrastructure, 
that explores environmental relationships and innovative approaches to serve society and to nurture systems at a variety of scales uh, in both urban and rural situations. The faculty and students in addressing the entangled web of everyday relationships between living things, humans, plants, animals, our dynamic biophysical context, continue to advance the landscape disciplines through their research and proposals in a multiplicity of scales and locally and locations globally. The recently established McCarg Center for Urbanism and Ecology is the research arm of the department, which produced the remarkable Atlas for the Green New Deal and recently a national super studio collaboration with institutions in the SLA and the practice. Certainly, currently, uh, the center has four core research areas. One is biodiversity, the global, the super studio, excuse me, the global land use mapping and particularly in regard to urban growth and critical biological hotspots where cities are impacting very important ecology. The global land use mapping um, also. And, and then we have climate policy, studies primarily around carbon sequestration. The public realm is also an emphasis upon equity and reparative justice, especially as manifest in spatial and physically built work. And then the center has the EM lab, the environmental modeling lab, which specializes in the analysis, simulation, and visualization of environmental systems. Significant leadership and participation in all of this is from the landscape faculty, as you would expect. There's a, another branch of Penn that affects our landscape department and we affect, and that's Penn Praxis, which could be considered the, the clinical arm of the school. And again, landscape faculty and students are deeply involved. 20 years old this spring, it provides practical outreach, consultation, and assistance to communities, to agencies, and to nonprofits. Recent projections, recent projects or rather, have, have occurred on several continents and in multiple communities and cities and with clients drawing upon interested individuals from several departments, the students and their faculty in the school. There's been continued and steady involvement, of course, in local urban issues within Philadelphia and in the region. But in recent years, partly in response to international diversity of our students, and the involvement of the faculty, the program has expanded the areas further afield in the nation and overseas. Now, the majority of its work is on urban issues and community collaborations with a focus upon participatory planning and hands-on involvement, often reimagining moribund or struggling public facilities like schools or parks, urban centers, and their transformation. Well, several remarkable projects have been in rural areas and with indigenous communities. Collaboration between disciplines within the school and with client communities and nonprofits has proved rewarding for us all. It's currently led by a graduate student of ours, a landscape architect who's now on the faculty. Well, in addition to the many books, articles, and professional works that are continuously produced by the faculty at Penn, a fourth, lands a fourth aspect of landscape at Penn is the biannual production, uh, publication of the award-winning LA Plus, which is edited and published within the department. It's devoted to advancing interdisciplinary ideas and expanding critical inter inquiry through the, the lens of landscape architecture. It is focused upon connections and collaborations between landscape architecture, urban design, architecture, preservation, and the sciences and humanities through essays, through interviews, through criticism and short form works on selected topics. So what then is the situation and direction of Olin? Uh, where are we and where do we desire to go? Well, as our mission statement says, we strive to create places that enhance life. Olin is a professional landscape architecture and urban design practice with offices in Philadelphia and Los Angeles. Most frequently, um, it, it, has, it has and it continues to produce high quality environments at multiple scales. Most frequently, they're urban, they're ecologically and socially driven, and they currently have been expanding in scale commensurate with the physical and social issues of today. This is partly a result of the growing understanding 
I would say on, on the part of many in institutions, in the government and in commerce about what architects, what landscape architects are, who we are, what we can do, and especially our role as coordinator and collaborators with other disciplines. And much of what is needed is we now know, of course, is beyond the scope and service of traditional architecture or any one discipline. As we see here with the numbers of the different portions of aspects of the Los Angeles River master plan that we did after a six year project. I mean, this began, you know, it went far beyond water and its associated issues or ecosystems even, or our parks and open space, but it also had to include housing and had to deal with gentrification and displacement along with arts and culture. And finally, with the operation and maintenance of the elements that we were producing. Well, like much of our work, the LA River Master Plan was health-driven, data-based, but it was also value-guided. You know, Olmsted was right about this. You know, it is it also that open space with its many expressions needs to respond to issues of justice and of equity. We have to advocate for all those who have no voice, whether it's children or the elderly, whether it's plants or animals, minorities, all sorts who really aren't in the room with the politicians, with the financiers, with the attorneys, with the engineers, and with the designers. Other current examples of work we have in the office right now are things like Origin Park on the Ohio River. It's a repeatedly flooded area that's formerly used for waste dumping. In, it's in Indiana, located opposite Louisville, Kentucky on the Ohio River, or the redundant 11th Street Bridge on the Anacostia River because this connects two very dramatically different districts of Washington, DC. This, this work really exemplifies an understanding of the impact of uh, the context uh, of uh, any design upon the environment and upon the health of the community and the prevention of gentrification and, and both it's the habitat loss of people as well as animals. So we're, we're interested in recycling at all scales, you know, from the tiniest matter uh, of, of physical materials up to the large acreages of land, especially in very difficult urban situations where working with abandoned and redundant industrial, uh, you know, ab abused, wasted, leftover areas adjacent and within New York City and San Francisco and in Los Angeles, we've ended up planning, designing, and building very extensive and remarkable new communities. Likewise, our office has continued to look for opportunities to restore natural systems and land within urban contexts that afford resilience uh, to the increasing storms and the floods that are occurring while providing significant habitat within the cities and health benefit for the citizens and linking and forming new communal space. So, in our design projects, we continue to pursue new technologies along with traditional craft. We're deeply interested in things like horticulture, engineering, communications and outreach, the delivery of services, and frankly, the art of our medium. Well, within the firm over the last decade and a half, Olin Labs was initiated as a proactive R&D group of to initiate research projects, to, to develop projects that we'd like to work on and to find clients and applications for ideas that we thought should happen, to, to find alternative sources of support other than traditional clients and to address agendas, not those of you know, commercial business or the public agencies as usual. Ongoing topics for the Olin Lab has been to include recycling and the utilization of waste stream materials such as glass and fibers and concrete or recycled uh, materials of all sorts to produce manufactured soils and to make new forms of construction materials, but especially to work on propagations of mixtures of, of varieties of native and other plants in response to climate change and to our growing project demands. Early initiatives of Olin Labs was the post-occupancy evaluation of our Canal Park in Washington, D.C., where we assisted in the development of the Sustainable Sites Pilot Projects, is now a national program, which involved collaboration between our design team and 
outside experts to advise a rigorous evaluation of methodology based on the best practices in the field and emerging trends in environmental psychology. A recent local study of we've has undertaken has been of an abandoned refinery. It's turned out it led to a national inventory of these sites and their opportunities. And we now have a, an actual project with a, a client who came to us because of it in, in Philadelphia. So like Penn Praxis and the Mark Karg Center, Olin Labs has been able to engage projects and research that's not tied to academic calendars or limited to the duration of a class of instruction or to a single client's needs or purposes, but instead to initiate investigations that are open-ended in both time and in imagination. So for Penn Landscape and for Olin, the past is truly prologue. Our, our work has been and continues to be data and analysis based. It's from an ecological perspective, and but it's purpose and it's value driven with high aspirations about the art of landscape design. So that's kind of where we are and where we hope to head. Thank you very much for your attention. Now I do something to speak. Mr. Lori. Thank you. So Odin, many thanks. Now we pass to the second section of our webinar in which the debaters will give a short presentation themselves and offer some questions to the three keynote speakers. The first one to speak is the Julian Raxworthy. Julian, do you want to progress? Sure. Thank you. So I'd like to start by First of all, thanking uh, Alex for getting me involved in this uh, webinar. And uh, I've been working on a project for a little bit that's, uh, I think, relevant here, uh, which is the Landscape Architecture Educational Program Census. Now, I'm a landscape fan. I know that a lot of you are here are landscape fans because it's late at night or early in the morning, and so you're watching. And so I'm really interested as a landscape fan and a believer in the profession and in the practice of landscape architecture. I think that landscape architecture and education are always tied. It's always someone's start is their education. And I think most practitioners always want to give back, actually. And the question is often, can they and how will they? Um, and so with that picture, I do think there are, demo, there are changes that are occurring in higher education in the world. Those changes are also reflected of the fact that people are actually um, in other parts of the world are developing programs in different sorts of ways. And the committee education and academic affairs is looking at those ways that the profession is developing. And so this project is a simple data exercise that is more complex than it looks because we have lots of active regions. And uh, you know, as we see from the amount of people who are on this call today, um, there is actually an enormous diversity and interest. And so in the first instance, we have to collect data from the regions and they have it at different times. And the, some of these projects people have done for a long time. And so the first part of the project is to really try to get a, a sort of an overall corpus of, uh, to some degree, what numbers are we talking about in size? And it was really interesting to me to discover in this process that even at the most rigorous at some points and other times improvisatory, and chat GPT did help me do some research to find some programs. Um, you know, we've, we've sort of found 436 programs. And so that's a lot. That's actually... You know, that's that's not all of it. There's a whole lot of places that are not being covered. And so the aim of this is to, to build up a series of layers where we start to, first of all, just get that census, but then start to understand some of the dynamics that are happening in global mobility in, in IFLA, in professional practice. So suddenly accreditation is important. So it seems like we're just talking about universities, but actually, no, we're talking about practice. And so in that way, we need to understand that how a landscape architect across the world relates to a another landscape architect is governed by education as well. So how do that talk to each other? And so part of that is understanding that not in a gatekeeping way, in a way that also recognises the differences that um, individual regions and cultures of place play. And that's something we heard a lot about in these presentations. Then after that, we get to these historical layers, which are, or these statistical layers, I suppose you could say, pardon me, of people to understand you know, what is the dynamics that are happening in education? Now, for those of us who are in education, like practice, it's got its own economics. It's its own game of operating uh, in a certain sort of way. And so knowing the health of the, of 
of the educational environment is understanding those basic things like teacher student staff ratios and the ability to communicate and finally in this other layer we have a cultural layer and that's one that i'm also interested in in my in my questioning in a moment is um you know that we're that you know these programs have started in different places and as i verified the identity of programs in the loose way that i could using google translate and whatever else it was fascinating to see programs arriving you know in in china in in the 1950s and 1960s um and start to pick up those threads of time which is in a way the landscape culture that we're i'm a bit of a, a bit of a nerd about and so this project um has really involved a um you know is looking in a certain sort of way at the moment which is and i'll just get my web browser up you know it's sort of you know it's data and we have we're collecting this data to try to understand uh you know what's around what status it's quite dumb it's google she google sheets how did i work out some functions to aggregate data i asked chat gpt tell me how to write a, fo a formula to be able to do this and so i did something that people do all the time it's a really simple thing seemingly and so you know i start here with south africa with africa because it's a place that I spent time in recently and that I have a, a deep love for. And then out of that and multiple things, we've then just started to be able to develop a sort of a, a spatial organization and ideas. And of course, it tells you things that are not really that surprising about the way that the that the programs are aggregated. So a lot of these are actually, um, you know, a lot of these relationships mirror other things that we see in our society um, and our global culture. But you know, it's, I thought you know that's nice. That's that's a program in the middle of the Pacific, right? And so you know that's cool. And so obviously, there's a whole like we see missing data. There's not enough data about about you know China, the the Russian Federation. There's more data I want to get into this process. But this is like a a layering process. And so I just wanted to 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 uh, to talk about that quickly. Um, now, the I've got a question, I think, uh, Alex, right? Is this so I might wind up that presentation and then ask yes. a question. Um, what I wanted to ask maybe is I've got a question for for Gunter, which is to say um, the when we're talking about, and I mean, it relates also to a number of other speakers as well, you know, when we're talking about culture in landscape and we're talking about this beautiful sense, you're talking about material culture, et cetera, and the urban, where does the social sit within that? I find with my students that their social interests are, are very, very developed and developing and their desire to engage the social with the economics of living in the city as a young person. Those things are really important. How do they factor in your sort of cultural investigations, Gunter? I think, yeah. Julian, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very good story. Yeah. If possible, I would ask Julian to give uh, the free questions. We collect all the questions and we reply in a package. Otherwise, it may go through in time. Okay, sure. Sorry, Gunter. That, that was question one. Um, you know, uh, question two is, Gunji, and I, this is an economics question as well. I'm in higher education in Australia. And, you know, Australia, there's an economics to education and landscape as well that everyone in the world uh, is is feeling around, particularly around the way that China has has sent its people out to also be educated in the rest of the world. And when you talk about landscape culture in China, I was really interested in that sense of how you think that the the kind of the birth, the growth of domestic education rather than Chinese students traveling overseas. Do you think landscape culture in China that you're talking about means that people might want to stay more and study local things with local people and celebrate the local or do you think that that trend towards the the uh, international travel for for study is still going to happen finally um you know Laurie in Australia we've got a big discussion happening that I came back to about First Nations people um, on land and uh, our and our relationship to it as the de descendants of settler colonists is that discourse something that you in your practice and education engage with and um, how do you approach it in your own practice and education? Those are my questions. Julian, thanks very much. I hope the keynote speaker can take note. Otherwise, we will shortly repeat the question later on. Now I want to ask Anna Jurich to introduce herself and provide their little questions, the short questions to the keynote.
keynote speakers. Yes. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear and see me. And I would like to uh, share my presentation as well. One second. Yes. So um, as Alex introduced me, firstly, I'm maybe one of the uh, outsiders um, of this whole talk. And first of all, I want really to thank um, the presenters um, for their really insightful um, presentations and also Ifla for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here as a curator of the SETKM. And since um, my institution has not much to do with landscape on first sight, I want to shortly introduce what we do as an institution and then also introduce you to a project that is um, connected to landscape and its involvement in our society. Um, so firstly, short introduction to ZKM. Um, ZKM stands for Center for Art and Media, and we are situated in Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, and the institution is quite young. It opened in 1997 in a former industrial building that you can see here on the picture. Um, and we have around 300,000 visitors per year and more on our digital uh, formats. So the 300,000 are the physical um, uh, visitors. Um, in the same building um, that you can see here in 1999, um, uh, the School for Art and Design in Karlsruhe opened as well. And it's important to mention because um, our institution as um, a center for art and media was always planned to um, collaborate with the School for Art and Design. And later I will also describe why this is so important to have the educational part included. Um, the ZKM is not only a museum, it's also, um, it holds a collection um, of media arts. Um, it is a research center, a laboratory and archive. Um, it focuses not only Anna, on shop. Anna, yes? mm -hmm. I want to clarify one thing. We are still at the first slide. Is that yes. okay? I uh, have uh, five slides. No problem, no problem. I just <laughs> worry. No worries. I want you to focus on me and not on the pictures. <laughs> okay. So, um, as I said, we not only focus on uh, showing and preserving, but also on developing and produ producing. So we have a publication department, um, a residency program for artists. Um, we have exhibitions here and installations we build up with um, artists. Um, and one special project we did here at ZKM was Critical Zones. And I want to do, introduce you to this project as well. Um, and on why uh, we as an institution became aware and responsible for landscape, even though in a really small scale um, compared to all of your uh, professional background. Um, so critical zones, as you are all familiar with, is a term um, that was brought to ZKM uh, by the philosopher and sociologist uh, Bruno Latour that you can see here in the uh, picture as well. Um, his approach was um, to add to the scientific term um, a political and social perspective uh, and, uh, and open a dialogue about it. And um, beginning, he was um, at the beginning of the whole project in 2018, uh, he uh, started a seminar over a time span of two years um, in this school of art and um, design that I mentioned earlier. And the seminar was hosted by Latour and there were many participants um, that came to Karlsruhe over the two years. It was an international group of um, scientists, researchers, artists, and students. And the whole group was later called the Critical Zone Study Group. And um, the whole idea of this long-term seminar was um, to learn about critical zones and try to find different approaches on how we can get ourselves, but also um, the, a larger social group um, getting aware of critical zones and what it means for our 
perception of living on earth. And the whole seminar um, began in 2018. And then two years later, there was um, an exhibition open at ZKM called Critical Zones, Observatories for Earthly Politics. Um, this exhibition was curated by late Peter Weibel, the former CEO, a media artist and theorist. And together with Bruno Latour, he um, yeah, produced this um, so-called thought exhibition, um, which was basically an invitation to deal with the critical situation of Earth in various ways and also to explore new modes of coexistence between all forms of life. So not only humans, but all of forms of lives. And um, doing that, um, it was a show for artistic approaches mainly um, on how the critical zone can be made visible and therefore be seen and understood in a better way. And the whole show was focusing on also emotions like sympathy and understanding for our surrounding. Um, and this was also approaching disorientation and disconnection on yeah, human beings far from um, the place they are living off and only focusing on the place they are living on. So the idea of the exhibition and also of the seminar was to become terrestrial, which is also a term that Bruno Latour um, was um, yeah, um, formulating in his approach. And it means that we have to realize that we are bound to earth and to land and our actions. And yeah, how we, how we can uh, work with that in the future. And the question of why am I here um, is probably is why is um, this approach so special in connection to an institution like the ZKM? And how can it be uh, one of the new ways of understanding a landscape maybe? Um, so the question would be, why do we care about landscape as a media art institution? And it was basically um, initiated by questioning our own actions as an educational institution. Um, so we had to somehow take action to become terrestrial ourselves. Um, and we did this in a really practical um, way of taking care of an orchard. So we are now responsible for a meadow with uh, fruit trees. Um, which means really basic um, things like we have to cut grass, we have to prune trees, um, we have to take care of a biodiverse space, and we have to take time to understand agricultural aspects apart from our everyday work life. And I think as a museum or as an institution, we are maybe freed from the pressure to actually formulate a solution um, for the current situation on earth. And therefore our approach can involve um, much bigger and looser contexts um, and point of views far, far from uh, practicality um, or actual human necessities. But I think that this project of taking care of the orchard um, is one first step towards becoming terrestrial and um, is not only a theory represented by us, but actual um, a landscape approach, I would say. And I think that's why uh, I was invited to be here. Um, and I would like to ask some question, uh, if Anna, I may. Anna, mm -hmm. may, may I rephrase these story of the orchard that you confirm if we understand it right yes of course it balance the footprint carbon footprint and social footprint socionatal footprint of the exhibition work at ZKM. ZKM bought a piece of land and preserved the natural state of this piece of land not only by preserving the land, but also by managing, maintaining the land over time. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Well, we not we didn't bought it, but we lease it from the city. 
and we are in uh, contact with the city councils and everybody to yes maintain it because we are obviously not um, familiar with what we have to do on the land. Um, but yes, the main idea was to uh, bring the carbon footprint um, yeah to. So a cultural institution bought and managed a piece of land to balance its own uh, carbon footprint. Yes, of one exhibition, of the critical zone okay. exhibition. <laughs> so please give, Sorry, us, give us the questions for the free speakers. Yes, I do. Um, I have one question that I would like to ask all of you that was partially also um, answered already, but I think it um, is an important question for me, especially um, if there are other than human identities um, considered in your work of landscape um, architecture. And if so, um, Mr. Olin, you already mentioned it earlier. Um, if so, uh, which are the ones and uh, would you like to include even more that you are already considering? And to um, each speaker individually, I have also one question, uh, Mr. Vogt, I would like to ask you if um, you mentioned Lucius Burkhardt as one of the references for your work. And I know that Lucius Burkhardt, for example, was also um, one of the authors that were uh, included in the Documenta 14 preparation, the huge art show in uh, Kassel here in Germany. And I would like to ask you if um, you also use approaches from other disciplines, um, scientific or artistic, um, to observe landscape, to get an another point of view. And uh, Mr. Yu, I would like to ask you if, um, since you described um, so intensely the motion between water and land and how your approaches to, um, yeah, to combine those two emotions. Um, um, if you are also in dialogue with arch architects um, that are focusing on building houses or living spaces um, that, yeah, want to learn from your approach um, to your understanding of landscape and water. And Mr. Olin, I would like to ask you if, um, I think you would describe many projects in, in really large scales. Um, and I would like to ask you a maybe personal question, if um, small scales, like for example, the orchard um, that we are taking care of in an institution, uh, if small scales um, are still something you think about or you want to think about more and if you, um, yeah, use small scales still in your practice to approach landscape. Thank you. Anna, thanks a lot. The last debater, Rosalia Monacella. Please, Rosalia, share with us your thoughts. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you for the invitation uh, to join the discussion today and being part of this esteemed group. It's an absolute honour. Um, so I guess, uh, firstly, just a little bit about me. I'm a faculty member in the Landscape Architecture Program at Harvard Graduate School of Design. My teaching expertise is in the de delivery of core design studios and my research expertise is in the careful indexing of shifting dynamic resource flows that inform the landscape of the city and the region. Um, I'll give a brief description on, on the key objectives of the book Designing Landscape Architectural Education, Studio, studio Ecologies for an Unpredictable Future that I co-edited with Bridget King. But before I proceed, I want to acknowledge the 33 contributors who without their contribution, the, the book would not have been possible. Um, for the most part, this book was produced during the first year of the pandemic. A multitude of stories, insights, analyses and concerns have attached themselves to our collective experience of the pandemic. One striking and persistent effect of the pandemic has been to evidence drastic systemic inequities across the globe, not least some of the very inequities that the frontline effects of the climate crisis exposed. 
The continuing experience made incredibly clear those who are the most vulnerable and that view, that view brings into more direct light the global collective pursuit required to address the climate crisis. Designing landscape architecture education, pseudo-ecologies for unpredictable futures is intended to accomplish two primary purposes. The first is to serve as a resource for academic practitioners preparing and delivering design studio courses. And the second is to serve students seeking guidance and insight into design methodologies as a part of their landscape architectural education. The work of the publication focuses on a manifold issues of manifold issues of the climate crisis. It asks designers and academic practitioners to describe their own work through an ecological lens and then to articulate design approaches for developing new practices in landscape architecture, teaching and research. A focus on design studio pedagogies is foregrounded as it positions the design studio as a pivot point for coalescing and synthesizing knowledge derived from other courses. Landscape architecture as a discipline needs to evolve rapidly as it responds to both broadening and intensifying changes in the environment, social and political conditions. These changing conditions require development and innovation in the core competencies of landscape architects. The book addresses two fundamental questions. What are the skills required of landscape architects to equip them to deal with the complexities brought forth by the climate crisis? And how can we design education of future practitioners. The book was bro broken down into five parts um, uh, and the works are organized within the parts with the understanding that no singular holistic view is possible. The intention was not to construct a unifying position or to integrate disparate approaches. The aim was to establish threads of inquiry and to simul stimulate generative and multiple gatherings and seepages. Each thread describes through the lens of ecological thinking, design methods and techniques that engage innovatively with key professional skills, site analysis, field work, material investigations and design processes. I should emphasize that the contributions reflect situations in the global north. These places and institutions have a very different type of work to be, to, to be undertaken through shared, the, the, the issues of shared legacies of imperial colonial action, that are collectively responsible for cl the climate crisis. These parts are bookended by the introduction, studio ecologies, and the conclusion tending towards a matter of ethics of ground. In the introduction, the book posits a declaration of ethics of the landscape architecture design studio. The design project that follows such a declaration would see the learning process imbued with the direct and implied effects of design on society and the biosphere. It would see a conscious integration into design studio pedagogy of the agency of the designer in managing those effects. The aim is to ingrain design ethics and ecological thinking into how design studios are pedagogically framed and delivered and to contribute to the academic positioning of each design project. This is then followed by three suggested design studio models three overarching models of pedagogical thinking and knowledge production set the stage for how to configure the landscape architecture design studio. Model for ecological and ethical um, entanglement, model for interactivity, model for reef configurations. These models draw upon collection of approaches captured in the five parts. They are not considered as discrete models, but potential modulations of the design studio pedagogy. In the conclusion, tending towards matter of ethics of ground, the book and its contributors argue that the business as usual approach in design education will, will be inadequate to face the challenges of the climate crisis. Therefore, a deep reconsideration of the role of design and the designer is required as a starting point for adapting to the curriculum. This conclusion takes this, um, form as a series of principles for tending to and matters of they enable a different approach to those that primarily facilitate the acquisition of skills. These actions create the conditions for the emergence and refinement of qualities that are qualities that are ways to approach design that allow for engagement with the complexity of the climate crisis. The emphasis on ecological thinking across the book's five sections gives rise to a number of thematic, uh, thematic matters of concern, 
each described as a call for action that formulate principles for tending to. The act of tending to describes ways in which these actions may be engendered. As a form of making, tending to implies care, empathy, and accountability towards other human and beyond human centric endeavors. It implies an ongoing reflective pedagogical practice that signals a shift from the modes of production to actions that prioritize cultivation for the design studio teaching. The matter of concern is with the, with, so in, in tending to matters of mutability, the matter of concern is with current governance systems, institutional structures and infrastructural determinism that emphasizes rigidity and resistance to change due to the persistence of archaic legal system of the archaic legal systems and codes that hark back to periods of white settlement when land was considered terra nullis, nobody's land. These impediments continually repeat and reinforce injustice. Tending to matters of reciprocity, the matter of concern is imperial knowledge systems that include geology, ecology, and biology. Historically, these systems have objectified species and constricted understanding through flawed measures, inherited and acquired of traits, fitness and reproduction. Tending to matters of exactitude, the matter of concern is projected systems of measure, cartographic systems such as, such as geographic information systems that are constructed a particular view of the world through coordinates and geometric projections. These systems of measure are often driven by prospecting for capital accumulation, extraction and surveillance. Tending to mat matters of novel agents, the matter of concern is the current value systems we impose on non-living systems, such as carbon offsetting, that gives license to continue current modes of living that avoids accountability for polluting the environment and that induces large-scale ecosystem loss. Tending to uh, the studio environment and tending to matters of multiplicity, the matter of concern is, with, is the studio environment that historically emulates and serves corporate and private practice models that consequently enforce singular design approaches and modes of learning. The institution tending to matters of um, collectivity, the matter of concern is with the institutional models that support hierarchical models of labor, segregated modes of knowledge production, and the paradigm of ongoing wealth accumulation. And here's an example of, for, for, of moving from matters of concern um, and tending to. And tending to matters of collectivity argues for a shift from singular domains of practice and demarcated borders. It cul cultivates formations of territorial and knowledge commons, cooperative structures, and assembling incongruous fields charged with the purpose of change through co-production. These goals are achieved through the three actions um, outlined here, to frame, to advocate, and to create. So this has been a brief snapshot of the book. Um, and again, I'd like to acknowledge those who, uh, my co-editor and those who have contributed to the book. Um, I very much look forward to the conversation and here are some of my, my questions. First, what are the transformations uh, needed in the design studio education to equip students to deal with the complexities Rosalia, for... Rosalia. Yes. The, this first question for whom? For for all three. Do you give one question for all of them? The same question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, what other what other transformations needed in the design studio education to equip students to deal with the complexities brought forth by the climate crisis, and that acknowledge the failings of our past? and cause no future harm. The other is what, so the other question that I, I propose to um, all three, um, no, noting that they're all design educators as well, is what does this imply in terms of the studio environment? How do we adapt the studio environment to respond to this? And what is it, what are the, on, what are the roll off, uh, rolling effects on the institutional structure? Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Mr. Falkt, do you need someone to repeat the question or are you ready to present, to reply? Um, I can try it. If I forget something, okay. you add it. No? So, okay. so first, please debaters, feel free to, to ask if something is missing. Julia, Rosalia, Anna, 
some of your questions are not answered, please point out. Mm -hmm. The first question was about the cultural landscape. And uh, I think <clears throat> landscape for me, and I have to say for us, for my colleagues in the offices and for the students, it's always a cultural production. Uh, since we work mainly in Europe, not only, but mainly in Europe, even there, you have such a difference between, as I mentioned, landscape, paysage, landschaft, paisaggio. But these are only words and not, <clears throat> not only a translation. It's really a cultural difference between, let's say, between the French paysage and the English landscape. It's a real difference. They are not talking, and I can see it in my offices if they come together, the French and the English. <clears throat> there is always in the beginning a, a discussion what are we talking when we talk about landscape? And that there is not <clears throat> a common understanding what they mean. And I mean, since we have only two Swiss people working here with, uh, you know, with the background of the mountains and beautiful lakes and so on. So we have to, <clears throat> to deal with the students because the students as well are coming from all over the world and in the office as well we constantly have to discuss what do you mean with landscape or what is your sense of landscape? And I'm not criticizing somebody from any other countries. Uh, so they all bring their background into the discussion. And that's extremely fruitful, I think. And that will change the landscape discipline in the future. This, uh, this background of uh, young people coming from different backgrounds. And I think it's a, it's a chance to, to deal with it, but we have to change the, work, the way we will work in future. This discursive system that we constantly have to discuss. Um, <clears throat> what you do, do you really mean? Therefore, we are doing a lot of uh, field trips into the landscape. Just two weeks ago, we did with all our colleagues in uh, a field trip for three days in the landscape, and then we can we can have an easy discussion. You know? The perception was completely different, but then we can discuss it. And it's not right or wrong, black or right. Uh, that's that's uh, very important for us. And the second was human identity. <clears throat> Um, of course, we are interested in human identity, and, and I have a bit to, to say. Since uh, our office in Switzerland, for instance, we can we can win a competition. We do a project, but in the end, there is a, a vote by the civil so civic society. And if the, uh, the, uh, the people are saying no, then it will never be built. That means we have to be very close to the society to understand what are the wishes and what. To are they interested in? Let's say if we, we, we design a park, we cannot just bring a, a nice design. We really have to know what is the interest of the society. And therefore, that's a bit the tradition where I'm coming from. We always have to relate it to the society. And then I think that's uh, uh, as a point of view, very important. Then the sec is, uh, ah, you asked about Lucius Burkhardt and what else <laughs> we are interested in. And you showed in ZKM's, I think it was Julien Charrier's exhibition, or a work by Julien Charrier in the middle. And he was a student from Olafur Eliasson, and we did a, a design workshop, Olafur and myself, with my students and his students. And, I still work with five of these artists uh, together. One is uh, Julien. When we were invited to the architectural biennale two years ago, the question was, was how will we live in future? Will we live together in future? And then I asked, uh, we can do it, but I have a question. What do you mean with we? I mean, is it only human beings? And then I said, we do it, but in a collaboration and we invited Julien with his work and uh, a hydrologist. And then we, we told them, listen, we are talking, when we say or understand we, we mean rocks, plants, animals, and human beings. And that's important. I cannot <clears throat> be responsible for everything. So then you really need interdisciplinary work, especially uh, with, with artists. And I think we all work together with architects or urban planners, but our main uh, collaborations are meanwhile artists and I'm 
I'm not an artist, to be very clear, but we like the collaboration. So for instance, with Olafur, we did several exhibitions. So last year for the Bayelan Museum, where we opened the facade and flooded the museum. And it's always a collaboration, but I'm not an artist. I'm an, in this case, I'm an expert as landscape architect, but not an artist. But this collaboration is for my colleagues in the office as well. It's very interesting to see a completely different point of view. Then, oh, yeah, it's the studio environment and the transformation <clears throat> in the design studio. I think there is a main problem and I really had a problem coming to the ETH. Nobody was interested to talk with me about new didactic, new pedagogy. Nobody was interested in till now, after 18 years, nobody was interested. And then I found out uh, studying Lucius Burkhardt's uh, library, he was extremely interested in, of course, he, he were more or less kicked out from the ETH in early 70s because he was in 68, as you know, and he was on the side of the students and, and so on and so on. But we found out he was mainly interested and it's not so known to find out what can we do in terms of didactic, because especially in Europe, it's still related to the Bauhaus. No? You, so it's a bit Bauhaus, a bit digital, and that's a real problem that I'm coming from the analog world. I cannot use a computer to, to draw anything. And my students are coming from the digital world and they are not really good in hand, uh, in sketching and so on. And we have, and it's our responsibility to bring it together. And that's what uh, Lucius Burkhardt, <coughs> it's really, he started in Geneva, then Zurich, then Ulm and Kassel. And in the end, he ended in the Bauhaus. He was the uh, uh, principal of the Bauhaus in Weimar. He ended where he started because he criticized not the uh, Bauhaus, but that we, after 80 years, we still don't have a concept for new pedal. And that's very interesting for me. And I have to say, <clears throat> I don't want to criticize any university, but most of the environment at universities are not so nice. And then everybody expects nice buildings, nice parks, but the environment where the students are working are really not so nice. Therefore, I agree that we have to do more teaching outside you know, to show and to explain what we mean. And so let's say, of course, my students, when they do a new building, they propose a wooden structure. And then I ask, but what are the consequences? Do you know what the consequences are? You can do it instead of concrete. The consequences that the island of Iceland <laughs> is transformed into a forest. And there were no trees 20 years ago, and now they produce really uh, wood for the building industry. These are the consequences. If we are talking about CO2, that's okay, but we have to, uh, to think about our consequences, whatever we do. And that's especially in landscape for the students in the beginning, not so easy to understand. They constantly think they are doing good things, but they are not thinking about the consequences when they propose something. And that's easier to explain outside the de design studio. I think that's all. Or did I forget something? I'm going to have to go at 11. Yeah, it was quite nice. Actually, for your information, Mr. Fox, I also need to add that as IFLA, we are currently trying to participate a program to build up a new vocabulary on landscape related terms, precisely mm -hmm. because as IFLA, we perceive this lack of theory, especially when we look nationally mm -hmm. and the difficulty to speak. At the end, Steffi Schuppel, when she will do the closing remarks, maybe she will point out something of this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I would like to ask Mr. Yu to reply to his own question. Okay, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, all these questions are very, very important. First by Julia about uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese study abroad. Yes, <laughs> the many students, students in America. I'm, I also studied from, I spent three years in America studying and two years working. 
uh, and actually Laurie, Laurie Olin was a former chair of the student, uh, uh, chair uh, at department, establishing a department at Tsinghua University in China. Uh, saying that is simply because China is for 5,000 years an agricultural dominant civilization. Um, until recently, we, 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 we miss in science, we miss in scientific understanding of the system. We have a rich, bond, a rich body of knowledge, which is based on ex experience, agriculture, medicine, you know, skills or building or whatever. But those are also just nature, just, just experience based. So I think sending students abroad to get the, the, the Western, the Western uh, science, uh, basically based on the uh, Renaissance system, how we should to classify the knowledge, to, to make people to systematically understand this, so it's the ecology, the plant, the plants, the animals, the, the, the soil. Now that's that's I think it uh, is very helpful for Chinese students, and even the, the Chinese program. We 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 still missing, I think, much. Uh, but but it's likely, it's likely they're gonna miss the local knowledge, which. That's why I describe it as adaptation, the landscape culture as adaptation to the environment, the locality, the, 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 the indigenous knowledge. Uh, it's been ignored here because we have so many books about the Chinese garden paintings, fine arts. You went to the library, you have all Chinese, you, 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 it's all covered. So, so for the Westerners, what do you understand Chinese culture is the other half, okay? The, the, the people who has the power, who has the, he has the right to write the history book. The peasant, the peasantry has no language. I mean, have no, no text, no, they, they have no right to write it, okay? So, but today, this knowledge becomes become so important because climate change now become a global issue. Well, for Chinese, for China, climate change is nothing new. No, we, we always have climate change. We have the monsoon climate. Yeah? We have dry, we have, we have flood. And we know how to do it. We know how to deal with it, the flood. But in the past 40 years or 30 years, we just copy the so urbanized urbanism, the so infrastructure, so-called this scientific method or scientific engineering system and dump into this kind of climate. And it failed, it failed. Of, of course it failed because all kind of pipe system can never fit into monsoon climate. And it, it will fail in, in India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and in, 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 in Africa, I will say, yeah? Now that's why I will, I will say the students should combine this kind of knowledge, the knowledge of systematic thinking based on science, based on industrial, industrial, uh, industrialization of civilization, and also combined with the local knowledge, which based on adaptation, right? Uh, that's that's uh, my answer to your question. Uh, and this is my advice to our Chinese students in America, in, in, in Australia, and also in Europe. So the second question is about uh, uh, water. I think that's about water. <laughs> Certainly water is, is cultural, most important. Naturally, it's a key factor, particularly for the monsoon region. The Chinese depend on aquaculture. We depend on rice, we depend on terraces. So water is, uh, is, a, is a key for, for understanding the landscape culture. Depending, if you have, you, you, you have to deal with little water, you have to deal with too much water. That's why this will be the key to solve today's problems, global-wise. And the knowledge, 
we accumulated here in the in, in China because of five thousand years is experiment. You know, it's a five thousand years experiment which provides so much rich knowledge, and that will provide, I think, for all kind of programs in the world to understand, uh, to learn from what we have accumulated here in China, or maybe from Mexico or, or Aztec people or, or, or indigenous. Uh, uh, but, uh, but China is, is, I will say, continuously have a whole bunch of knowledge. It's going to, it's going to be disappear. It's going to be wiped out by this so-called modern technology. Uh, so that I really insist that uh, uh, we, we, should, uh, we should learn, we should study it and, and modernize it and make the scientific model, a new language, this language will solve today's problem of climate change. Uh, uh, that's, that's what we did here for, for a long time at, at the Peking University uh, as, as a research team. We have educated about uh, 1,000, I mean, uh, 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 1,200 students, mainly doing scientific research, performance study about the Chinese uh, a uh, 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 module, I, I will say, is a Chinese way of doing different kind of landscape, agricultural landscape, right, basically. And uh, combined with Trunescape, that doing experiment, right? Doing design, but design as experiment and produce data for the student to learn from and create a new, new prototype or new model or new language for, for doing a landscape. Yes, I think these are basically two major questions uh, for me to answer. Is that right? Yeah. I will leave uh, Laurie for the identity issues. <laughs> the identity issue. <laughs> well, um, I was asking you one thing. Sorry, Mr. Yu, there was still one question about how to teach landscape architecture. If you're trying to have new ways to organize the design studio of landscape architecture or the school, especially because you are so involved. Yeah, how to teach, that's, that's a, a big issue. I've, I totally agree with Gansler, uh, Gansler that we have to go outside, not in the classroom. You have to be now, you have to be able to know how to grow rice, how to cultivate uh, a corn, how to divert water, how to manage water. Uh, and there's no other way. You need to be, if you want a landscape architect, you really have to be to learn farming, farming the land, cultivating the land. So as a four, okay, so there's all kind of a, you have agriculture. Now that's, that's a, the dominating the Chinese. You have a, 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 a ranch, in English, you have to know how to, to take care of the ranch. So that's, I think, so it's a big culture. The big culture is the way of living. The big culture is the way of making a living uh, because that's the way to get this knowledge to adapt to the environment, adapt to the climate. And that's the only way to make the landscape sustainable because you want to take care of your children. You want to take care of the generations who want to feed on the land. Now that's about sustainability. And that's why industrialization make a mistake that because it disconnected the man from nature, right? So I think the, 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 that's why I'm thinking the global wise, we need to establish different kind of courses, different kind of programs. We should establish campground, a thousand campground global wise. Now that's, that's what I'm doing here actually. I, I have already, we have already five, uh, three, three summer, summer campus which means we can shift around and do a studio on site. And we did, we did it with, uh, with uh, uh, Australian uh, Monash and we, we did it with uh, AA school here. We also, also did it with Pan in one of our campus. It's set in the Lulo side and you can stay there for whole months and doing studio together. And then to work through the landscape to learn about it and, and, and cultivate and, and, and build, build. Yeah, that I think is a, we have to change. Otherwise, we become 
a science program, not, not a practical professional program. Huh? Thank yeah. you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Oli, do you need the debaters to repeat the question to you or you can progress? I know what the questions were and I only have a few okay. minutes. I'll try and go quite succinctly, um, I hope. Um, the first question was about uh, indigenous peoples and our relationship to them. And the truth is that uh, we have been involved in many ways, both in Penn through the studios, through Penn Praxis and through my own practice, actually. Um, at Penn, uh, I gave six, five or six studios in uh, New Mexico, three with uh, Santa Domingo Pueblo and two with the Navajo Nation, uh, where we took students, uh, we, they were very immersive, you know, the answer, everyone keeps saying, get them out of the building, <laughs> you know, get them off campus, get them out there, get their feet dirty. Um, so part of our projects were to work with Native Americans in their uh, own homes and in their own uh, territory and help them with what they defined as their problems. And they always turned out to be housing, community space, uh, eco-defense and uh, food security and education. Those were their questions. And we, and every studio turned into a housing studio no matter what I did. It was quite wonderful. Uh, and they always had to do with water because water is the blood of the earth. And we were working in the Southwest where there wasn't much water. Um, so, so those were uh, Penn Studios, and they still are going on in various places from time to time. Um, the Penn Praxis has done some work with the uh, Lenape Nation uh, in the Delaware Valley about their sacred landscapes and the preservation and how to stop encroachment and restore some of them. And uh, I would say our office had a very interesting project with the uh, uh, the Ile Saint Jean uh, peoples uh, in the Gulf of New Mexico, uh, because floodwaters were coming up over their native, uh, their traditional settlement. Uh, they were on an island uh, in, in near uh, off the coast of uh, Alabama, uh, near right next to Louisiana, and they were flooded. We, they had to move. It's like the, Esk the natives in Alaska who have had to move over thirty villages from the rising sea. So we we worked, um, our, our studio, Richard Rourke, my partner, worked with uh, the state of Louisiana and Alabama uh, and with these people. And it was very difficult because all of the situations that are set up for Native Americans are counterproductive as far as I can tell. Um, I, I don't wanna go on about that, but um, I would say working directly with the people and helping them, they now have a new home. They have a new settlement and they're on dry land for this foreseeable future, but it, but it was designed with them. Well, that's that question. That, um, I was asked about um, which, which creatures other than humans we, uh, we advocated for in our work. And I would say that um, with the exception of megafauna, which I'm very fond of being from Alaska, but one of the problems is that it's very difficult to accommodate them in human settlement, um, especially uh, some of the great marvelous carnivores. But um, we, we basically have found that one of the major things we can do in urban landscapes is to help with uh, migratory birds, which have a very difficult time moving through a lot of the uh, regions where cities are, because the cities tend to be near waterways, which are next to flyways. And there are these great gaps where the birds have difficulty finding habitat as they move through annually. So migratory uh, wild, wild uh, waterfowl and birds, songbirds, etc. But also in some of our projects, we find that it's very easy to uh, accommodate all sorts of small mammals and uh, and invertebrates and uh, you know lizards and all that sort of stuff. But um, we really quite often with planting favor uh, pollinators because. We find that um, that's another huge crisis, the, the business of pollination. So on a project in uh, Cupertino, we had 150 acres uh, for a commercial uh, landscape. And one of the things we ended up doing was we've managed to get the, we did some ecological inventories of the site before we did the construction. And then there was the you know destruction and then um, we we tore up everything that was there and then put it all back together in a whole new way. And the, the native bee population went up from about 
uh, five or six species. We're up to about 14 now. We're hoping we'll get it up to around 20 some of the native, uh, there's a, a 34 native bees uh, that are part of California. So the notion of actually knowing who you're advocating for, you know, is it the Savannah song sparrow? <laughs> are you helping, who, who's getting helped here beside the, the kids and, and the elderly and, and the office workers? Um, it, it's, it's, it depends, but we try to keep a broad as spectrum as possible. And when we think of habitat, I hope that answers the question. Um, part, of, part of the answer is doing uh, orchards and agriculture whenever we can fit that into projects tends to bring in a whole series of other animals and insects which are very beneficial. Um, she also asked me about scale. There was a question about scale. Do we still do real projects instead of just mega planning? And the answer is yes, of course. Um, one of the projects I showed you was actually 30, the, the little project in Portland, Oregon, the Rector Park where all the kids were splashing around on a fountain. That was, it's 35 meters by 100 meters, the whole project. It took a number of years and it's built on top of a five-story parking garage, believe it or not. Um, so one of the things that I find is that um, the only measure of the worth or the value of large-scale planning is what gets built and that people can touch. That um, the, the value in it is in projects and pro large-scale plans only are achieved through, through projects. And projects are funded and they have small chunks of things. And even if you work for 25 years on a master plan, which I've been doing on a couple of projects, um, they get built one piece at a time. And those pieces still need to be put together as carefully as the private residences that we still do. I, well, two years ago, I wrote an essay about why I still do private residences. <laughs> and it's, it's partly to keep your hand in at that scale. It's partly to deal with the sort of psychodrama of real people and their needs. And it's partly to deal with uh, helping train and raise uh, young landscape architects in the office so they learn the craft of making things at a fine, fine grain and fine scale. You know, that the thing you put your rear end on when you sit down, you doesn't want to tear your dress or whatever, that sort of thing. So, so we still place a great emphasis on site scale design at all, all uh, sizes. Um, then finally, uh, the next thing um, I have to say is that uh, I was asked about the studios and teaching and the whole problem. And I think both Gunter and uh, Kunjan Yu have said exactly the correct thing, and that is get them out of the studios, get their hands dirty. I mean, one of my teachers, Rich Haig, said he never trusts a landscape architect without mud on his shoes. And, and it's, it's sort of true that... Uh, I believe there's the first thing is who's in the studio and changing who's in the studio, bringing the women in has changed the profession dramatically. Fabulous, you know. I, I now am a retiring person from a woman owned firm uh, for the record. And I would say that, um, so bringing women in changed the studio right there. That was the first thing that changed studio teaching. I would say our big struggle now is to bring in other minorities, uh, people of color, people with disability. That will change the studio and how it gets taught and who says what and who, who's allowed to speak. And then I think everyone has said immersive uh, teaching and analog skills. Um, for all of the magic of the digital world, uh, frankly, I have to get the students out and make them sit still and draw and be some and just be there. And I think that that's where I'm going to end. I'm going to end with the, the reality of being in the world. And that's, uh, and, and having a world that we all still can be in and want to be in. I actually have to leave, I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you so much. And thank you, Ifla, and thanks all the participants. I've enjoyed this very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you also. Sorry, and, Steph, uh, send me, send, I'll, I'll look at the recording because I'm interested in what, my, uh, our old friend Steffi has to say. We are, Fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. We are close to the end. Steffi is gonna talk soon. Sorry for the little delay. Uh, Anna, Rosalia, Julian, are there any other curiosities you want to ask? Any last curiosities? Otherwise we pass to closing remarks. Is all, all fine. So for the moment, for the moment, Anna, you also, is there something you want to ask? No.
Many thanks, Anna, many thanks, Rosalea, many thanks, Julian, many thanks, Gunther, and uh, many, many thanks, uh, Mr. Yu. Um, I hope this meeting was also a way to, for you to meet each other and meet new people, new academic, and uh, possibly interact uh, with them in the future. Uh, we have a one last uh, uh, contribution is from our chair of the 75th anniversary group, Steffi Schuppel. I hope Steffi can give us a, a short, uh, conclusive remarks and uh, opening to what will be, which will be the new activities for the 75th anniversary group that are not yet done this year. Thanks for everyone for the moment. Steffi, please. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm sharing my screen with you. I hope you can see well. I make this also full screen. Um, so, um, hello also from my side. I'm very thrilled to see you all here and thanks for joining the webinar. My name is Steffi Schüppel. I'm a landscape architect from Dresden in Germany where I also have a private practice together with my partner, and I'm the spokesperson for international affairs of the BDLA, the Federation of German Landscape Architects. And uh, at the same time, I'm the chair of the IFLA 75th Anniversary Working Group. And um, I would like to give you a short overview of what we planned for this uh, anniversary year and what is what we did already, what is still to come. So one of our key elements is a publication that we are working on. It's called the IFLA 75th Anniversary Green Book. Um, we, had the, we took the idea from in a publication which was published for the 50th anniversary, but we intend to have a completely different look and feel to this publication. It will be a sort of coffee table book. It will talk about IFLA, the history, the timeline. It will contain statements of presidents. It will contain portraits of the Sir Jeffrey Jellico award winners and a lot of images of natural, cultural and built landscapes worldwide for which we also launch a call to the colleagues to, to send us their pictures. So uh, there will be not just the hard facts, but also some stories and to, uh, like things behind the scenes so we will uh, we are still working on the book but we intend to to publish it uh, and uh, present it at the um, world council and the world congress in nairobi and stockholm in september we have a series of webinars and hybrid events uh, one of these you you are joining at the moment we had one already in june which was called IFLA 75, the history and impact of a professional network, which was a hybrid event as a roundtable discussion. Today, we are talking about landscape culture today and tomorrow, and there will be a third one coming up uh, the end of August or beginning of September. We don't have clearly defined a date yet, which will be about the future of landscape development. And uh, we will keep you posted on the IFLA website for the precise dates. There are also two initiatives. One of them is to be launched in the next days. It's an artistic landscape competition for the landscape of the future. This is a call to send us uh, their, your imagination of the landscape of the future. It's open to everybody. You, you don't have to be a landscape architect to join. Any person, any citizen in the world can join. Um, so stay tuned also for that. There will be more information on the IFLA website and in social media. And also one thing that Alessandro talked about earlier is the SEEDS initiative that we uh, team up in this project, um, which is to collect landscape vocabulary in different um, languages and dialects uh, for which in English, there's no proper translation. So we will use the, um, the network of IFLA to reach out to all the colleagues in the world to help us with this landscape vocabulary. And also for this, there will be new information coming up soon. Um, there are also initiatives in the various IFLA regions. So here you find a choice of what is going on. There will be um, uh, publications or, or webinars in IFLA Africa about a decade in, um, in IFLA for Africa. If La Europe had an event in the context of the European Green Week, which this happened already in the beginning of June, 
there will be in IFLA Americas a student competition, some webinars, and there will be launched uh, the Americas Region Landscape Architecture Online Network. IFLA Middle East will organize as well webinars about productive landscape and uh, water management. And in IFLA Asia Pacific, there will be a social media campaign about IFLA's history, and there will be a gathering of the current and past delegates of the national associations. Obviously, also the World Congress and the World Council in Nairobi and Stockholm will be an important part, part of the celebrations. Uh, we will present the results uh, of the artistic landscape competition. In that context, there will be a, a special paper session uncovering hidden histories about the, the history of IFLA. And as I said before, we will launch the uh, anniversary green book. And we will also have a formal closing event, and this will be in the context of the 12th Barcelona International Landscape Biennial. And this will take place on the 28th of November. And all these events, which are still coming up, we are finalizing at the moment. So I invite you to, to keep, visit every now and then IFLA, the IFLA World website. And there's a special section for the anniversary celebrations where you can find all the detailed information. And also keep an eye on your social media. We will share all this content there. So thank you for your attention, and I hope I will see you in some future events in this celebratory year. Thank you. So that said, thank you everyone. Thanks on behalf of our president in New Zealand where he stays, it's too late right now to be with us still, but I'm sure it will be give like, a, yeah, thanks to everyone and so. Thanks to the debater, thanks to the speaker, thanks to the public to join and stay with us so long. I hope everyone will follow the activity of IFLA for the 75th anniversary with uh, bigger interest and uh, please stay with us for the next webinar. See you all, have a good day, have a good afternoon, have a good night and bye too soon. Thank you, the wonderful organization Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.